All right. Hey, everybody. We're back with Victims of Crime. Uh, we're here with Ryan and Brian from Undertaking the Podcast and your favorite, John Hill, uh, an instructor and a field director and embalmer down in North Carolina, even though I want to You got it right. North yep. Carolina, North Carolina every time. And the boys, Ryan and Brian, are over in Indiana there. How many years of licensing do you guys have between all of you, all three of you? I have seven. seven. I seven. Two. John? Three. Two. Less than 30. Less than 30. Like and I think, John, years. you've probably embalmed more bodies in your two than many people do in their, like, 30. Yeah, I've been very blessed. Got a lot of experience and a lot of exposure for sure. So, so today we're talking bodies in barrels and not really something we encounter a lot in our career. I've seen one body in a barrel, which is pretty dang unique. Bodies in barrels. barrels guys. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Like mob style. <laughs> I think this is kind of hitting the news right now. So Lake Mead out near Vegas. It's not that far from Vegas. The water level is down to like 27% capacity last I read an article. So it's like so far down. Well, where do you think they dump all the bodies in the barrels and the bodies and all the mob stuff? And so they keep finding, I think they're up to four in the last couple of weeks that they found bodies because it's exposing them from the water level being so low. So one of them, the first major one was they found a barrel, the body's coming out. They're talking about like, who could it be? And going through all the theorizing of, you know, could it be this person connected to the mob? Could it be this person? He's in like his Kmart special outfit from like 1979 or something. And, you know, thinking about who it could be. If you guys think bodies and barrels, what result of being in that kind of environment would you hypothesize? I have so many questions. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the result would look like. I mean, honestly, I think that there's a lot of challenges there. Um, probably a lot of research that goes into that before it really gets to us in, in certain aspects. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I It would be interesting. I've never experienced that. I think I, I one thing I, I I'm going to hate I don't hate to say this, but the storyline behind it, I, it's always interesting, yeah. um, especially that era in time. So I hate to say that. I don't want to disrespect the, the, the death of anybody, but the storyline behind that, there's so much history that's so, so unknown, uh, yeah. especially when it comes to that, too. You know, I, I, I really I, I like that history behind it. Um, but and I don't know. I don't know what you do I, it, until until they identify him, and and you know we we make contact with the family and go from there. I, it just I don't know. Never been in that situation, but the storyline, I I love the storyline. You know what? Let, let's uh let's ask Pastor Tom here. Um, Pastor Tom, now that you're an, an educator, you are educating. Um, let's refresh our memory, Ryan. You're on board with this, so. Um, a body out in the open, you know, one day of decomposition. If you bury that body, that one day, if it's underground, is three days to every one day above ground. And then if you're underwater, I think it's every seven days to every one day above ground. Um, Pastor Tom, what do you think, buddy? Well, the first thing I thought of when Carrie said bodies and barrels, I was thinking of that Dexter episode where there was a bunch of bodies and barrels, but this is real life. What's going on here. And obviously it depends on, first of all, how long the body has been in the barrel, how long death has occurred before we can do anything. Uh, but a body being in a barrel, I'm wondering, were they tied in there? Were they already dead when they were placed in there? Um, I'm thinking of if a body's in a barrel, they're cramped in there. They, I mean, all of that. Of so, oh yeah. There's, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of thoughts that are running through my mind right now with case analysis and what you have to deal with. And one of the things is obviously the body's cramped. I mean, the body is, you know, contracted and trying to get the body out from that position. Um, and so obviously the decomposition part of it and, 
So, you know, there's just so much entailed there, especially trying to get the body out of the barrel, everything. I mean, it's just a lot, a lot to digest. Yeah, so what do you think, well, that. Carrie, Carrie, this is a real thing though, right? But, like this right. is happening yeah. four, four but, times within like X amount of time. So but from, what I, I, from what I see here, it's, they're, they're just bones left. Yeah. I mean, from what I mean, I've been saying, it's nothing. Yeah. The so. one that's like, like mead, it's open. So yeah. it's exposure. It's not like it was a contained sealed environment. The barrel was found opened. And then, then for the first time, that one is more exposure to the water, exposure to elements. I mean, that body is definitely not just a barrel body per se was shot. So definitely an execution put in a barrel to dispose of the body. Okay. Totally like mob style back in the day. And I'm a like Ryan, like I'm a big untouchables, Kevin Costner. Like I love the, that whole, everything was kind of my jam back in the day, just loved all of that. So there is intrigue by that. Like, how did this man get to the barrel? Like, who did he piss off? And like, how did you do, you know, like, cause we, so right near me, um, Al Capone was big up around where I live. So mm. like, he has houses and like his girlfriend was buried not too far from here. And so there's just a lot in the area. We always are like, you know, who's buried where and who's at the bottom of what lake. And so literally this guy was at the bottom of the lake though. That's kind of just crazy. Wow. You know, uh, uh, I look at this from an embalmer standpoint. It's like we have soft tissue left. Yeah. We might, and I just say might be able to try. I mean, the, you know, and, and when embalmers look at this case, like it's either yes or no, or either no and i'll try or just no like you know so most people who have i hate to say be buried in a barrel under under a, <clears throat> under a lake like good god like it's yeah, been a right. while soft tissue is gone there's nothing we can do um, I was as, say, Emba- Brian. as embalmers if there is soft tissue there we might be able to do something um ryan and i have been trained by some of the best embalmers in the world um ireland specifically um we know that there's a lot you can do to provide that that viewing time that open casket time but if we're talking years i don't know man like guys i feel like it's gonna be soup and bones at that like if it was a closed, like super closed, I don't know. I'm, it's uh, you're not, guys. You're not getting anything back. Forty years underground or uh, uh, in a yeah, barrel. Yeah, forty. Underground. There's no way. I mean, the, the biggest thing that we're, we, the the <laughs> the biggest differentiation, I guess, as to whether we can or we can't do something is time. Um, you know, the barrels that I saw had holes in them. They were deteriorated. They were rusted out. But I mean, we can't do it. There's nothing. There's nothing that's happening there. It's a bone recovery, and it is. There may be one thing, element, though. The, the there elements. May, there thing. may be one answer. There may be one answer. Um, y'all know about face reconstruction, and I'm not right. talking about necessarily from the embalming standpoint. I'm talking about from a forensic anthropology standpoint. There you go. So they are able to take a skull just like all of these. And there are professionals. They can do them computer now. But back in the day, they were able to create a whole wax head. And there's been times where they found skeletal remains, especially the skull, and they couldn't figure out who it was. So they did the anthropology. They did the face reconstruction. And they just put the posters out there. Uh, This person is who was found. They kind of look like this. And they've been able to identify the deceased by those facial reconstructions. Is it that Sumter County Jane and John Doe, or there's a Jane and John Doe that that that's what they did because that's all that was left. But there was an episode of my yeah. and MacGyver did yeah. pencil. Well, well, um, Brian was talking about um, you know being trained from the best in Baltimore in Ireland. Same with me. Uh, Glenn Talon, I asked him, I said, if you're, cause I asked him about a facial reconstruction like that. I said, if you just had a skull, would you try something? He said, absolutely. 
He said, absolutely. We all and try. so, I mean, that's, yep, that's it. You just try, you just try. try. And, and uh, I'm, not, I'm trying to look into what is more involved with taking a skull like that with anthropology and how they're able to create a wax face with that skeleton. I just find it amazing that, that they can look at the skeletal face and the, and be able to, okay, this is kind of like the layers of the muscle. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is kind of, you know, we know the ethnicity and the race of the person, right. whether they're male mm -hmm. and whether they're female and they're mm -hmm. able to reconstruct that. Yeah. And so, I mean, well, I, I'm all about learning. I'm all hey, about raising the bar and Hey, you, why not? Why hey, not try? Hey, Brian, Brian, look yeah. at me real quick. Do you see his preacher hands just moving everywhere? Oh, <laughs> pastor Tom. <laughs> Yeah, he he did. Why not? He, he, we try. he was doing the we accordion thing. He was doing the accordion thing. I love it. <laughs> so I think that makes me think of that episode of Bones that it, which is forensic anthropology, and they had a body in a um, barrel, and when they opened it, there was uh, they had created the soap. As somebody asked me about, which is kind of where this whole video stemmed from, is somebody was like, "What about bodies in barrels? And what about the soap?" and saponification that happens where the tissue kind of turns into soap. It's not real soap. It's not like you're, it's, you're taking it and washing anything, but uh, it's very rare. It's super rare. It's where the tissue just turns into this adipose here and it becomes waxy, but it's got to be the right exposure, the right scenario, the right enzymes and everything happening. So it's not like happening all the time. You don't just stick a body in a barrel and then get like dove come out the other side. It's not really, <laughs> I will say, I think of all of us, I've been the only one that's had a body in a barrel that I've seen. And it was only a couple months been in the barrel. I'm actually the family, we did a viewing and the family, well, for the family, at least, um, she was super shiny. And I don't know if that's some of that waxy going, but super shiny you couldn't inject at that point but you could embalm because embalming is not injecting so you could cut, preserve from the outside and try to keep what tissue is there not moving okay whoa 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 you whoa. were able to have a viewing with someone who is in a barrel for more than a couple months mm -hmm. she, wow super idea you know what is what do they tell us if they're not perfectly I, what is it? They're not perfect. Identifiable, recognizable. Identifiable. Yeah. I mean, she Acceptable. looked exactly yeah. like her. Um, no kidding. Some of her wow. hair was kind of coming off, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if uh, she was shiny because there's a lot of fluid underneath, yeah. you know, her yeah. skin. But. Well done, you, uh, Carrie. Your team. Um, I didn't. I didn't totally do, but was overviewed and, you know. It doesn't, ma it's just it's doesn't matter though. Like who, who, whoever's in charge of this, like there's credit to go. Well, like, yeah. And I think so when you important. encounter those scenarios, it's not like, oh, I know exactly what to do. No, no, you have to reach out to all of your people and you go, oh my God, what would you guys do? Because it's got oh, yeah. a combination of ideas, I think at that point. And what do you, what can you try? What is going to be the best of all the theories in this scenario? Cause we don't all deal with this every day. And mm -hmm. that's where I think a lot of people, unfortunately in our business mm -hmm. think they know the answer and would never reach out, but it's putting aside the ego in that kind of scenario and saying, Oh my God, John, I have a body in a barrel and what the heck. And <laughs> Get over here. First of you all, got to no. get the body out of the barrel. That's yeah. get, get well, that's the barrel. what the medical examiner is for. They do that part. There you go. There no, you I go. mean, like, I I could use that barrel, but, like, like you're right, though. Like, you got to get the body out of the barrel. You got to do your pre-embalming case analysis. You got to do all of that. But here's the key is, like, and this is what I, <clears throat> Carrie, I want to say this for, because I know just like our show, uh, Undertaking the Podcast, we have at least half of our listeners who are not in funeral service. Mm -hmm. If you ever run across a funeral home that says, no, it's a closed casket, time to find a new one. Um, there is someone out there. <coughs> Chances are they're not very far away. Like I am in the smallest community of the smallest communities. And 
I don't I hate to say it. I it's kind of I feel like it's a little bit of back padding, but no, recon, I I am a reconstructive post mortem surgery. You're gonna try. Ex- You're gonna try. You're not yeah. gonna. My goal is that. to make that casket open. My goal Absolutely. is that because Absolutely. I I I you all of us have watched the news when the planes go down in the ocean when the buildings collapse we stop and we we find what's left because yeah. knowing is better than not knowing so it's my rant well i think that's one thing a lot of people don't realize about embalmers and about funeral directors and stuff is there's varying degrees there's varying degrees of comfort of skill of all of it i no. have walked in to do a trade embalming before and the funeral director met me before even going in he goes i've already told the family there's no viewing post cast oh, only option and i was like why? Yeah, he's been yeah. like two. Yeah. Days. Why? Two days. Two days. He's. Been. I just don't understand that because when, no way. when, yeah, I mean, no. Carrie, think about it. The person that died that was in the body, their body was in that barrel. Mm-hmm. How much did it mean to that family knowing that this was such trauma that they went through? Right. They needed to see. They seeing is believing, right? right. They needed that. And when someone is taken from us such so, so tragically and unexpectedly, you know, uh, there is no doubt in my mind all the family thought they were going to see their loved one again before yeah. this thing happened with her being in the barrel. So, I mean, it's just amazing how, it, how comforting it is when such trauma like this takes place. To have mm-hmm. that final moment, to have that final Something. farewell just that they Something. need. Yeah. Absolutely. They yeah. have to have it. You know what? Our last video, yeah. Yeah. No, just think of it this way. I'm, you know, what John said. Knowing is better than not knowing, Mm -hmm. and you know, you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to give some advice to consumers because, like, you may be in this situation one day, and this is what's so important to all four of us here. If you find a funeral home that says no there's another funeral home down the road that can say yes. We may have an opinion. Yes. We may have to fly someone in from South Carolina or Missouri or Chicago, but there's another embalmer that can do this, that can give you that time. And I just, you just may have to pay for it. You you may have to pay for it. You know what? And fine. You know, like, I think we're all, no, 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 no. It has to be stated. Well, (laughs) Yes. God, you make me choke, Ryan. <laughs> God love you. Um, no, it ha- does have to be stated. Like, this is what we're going to do. This is what we propose. Um, so, yeah, there may be a fee in there. Um, but that one last time, and I, I keep thinking back to Eileen Hamra, who wrote a book, uh, was on the podcast, uh, Time to Fly. And her husband died three days before Christmas plane went down full of christmas presents mm. and she was able to have that one last time with Absolutely. her husband and she explains it so well there's only one last time to have that one last time and once it's once once it's over once someone's cremated once someone's buried there is no one last time you know yeah. you know i agree that's Absolutely. what we do here. That's what we do as embalmers is we make it happen. We, we, we just make it happen. And I hear a lot of those stories where people go, I don't know why they didn't let me see them. I don't know why I couldn't do this. Why are they in charge of it? And I'm like, that they're not. I said, I don't know what they, what the scenario was. I don't know what your loved one looked like, but you have the final say. Yeah. You do. If you and do. They, and, if you and do. even yeah. though they get buried or and even though they get cremated, they still didn't see. They did not have that time. Yeah, and so they still will not have that acceptance, even though they know that it's them. There's proof that it's them. They did not have that time to see. You, yeah. so. you, you cannot deny it. You know, I think all of us, even John, you, you're pretty new here. Don't mean to throw you under the bus, but none of us have had a family walk in the door and I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm confidently going to say it. No one has walked in the door and go, I wish I didn't see them. No. Exactly. No, they walk in the door and go, God, I wish I could have seen them. I, I just want to make sure they were in there 
And it, absolutely. And that absolutely. seems that seems so foreign to me. But it's like, you know, if you don't look, you don't know. You're you're trusting my word. Like, right. where the hell am I? Yeah, if if I don't bury them or cremate them, where the hell am I gonna put them? I can't keep people around. Like, this is not this is not a thing. Like they're either in their casket or they're not. And we want you to see. Yeah. Is is what it is. Well, a lot, a lot of people in a barrel or not. Well, I know we've been talking nope, get them out of the barrel. To consumers too. The consumers, you know, what they need to know. But us as funeral directors, I think we've got to believe in what we're doing again. Gotcha. I think we've got to believe in that final time again, because how many times does someone chalk up to, you know, and I hate to use that word, but that's literally what it is. You no, know, just cremation. And I, why, why do you not want to see him? What's, what's your reason? Instead of being a funeral directees, we need to be funeral directors and ask those questions. And um, there's nothing wrong with that because I've had those same families come back six months later, you know, I probably should have uh, had that time, you know, but they're working off of that impulse at the moment that all those rush of a feelings of emotions they're going through that their loved one has just died. They think that this moment, this is the best decision. And this is, and it's good for us funeral directors to say, whoa, let's, let's really take our time. Why do you not want to have that final moment with them? Whether no they're one. embalmed or not, you know, just that view and that private time to where you have that final farewell with them. Why not? And, yeah. um, you know, I'm batting a thousand for a thousand right now with people <laughs> that are having that final time with your bat too, Brian. Where's your bat? I need your oh, bat oh, for oh, that. Oh, here we go. Yep, raccoon bat. There it is. There it is. The raccoon slayer. <laughs> Thank That's you, it. Carrie, for that. Um, You're welcome. That's from one of our beer with the boys videos. So go check out the raccoon. I think that was in the paranormal episode. We, we, that went completely sideways talking about raccoons. I have no idea, but hey, you asked. Yeah. So we're going to dial this one off. So thank you guys for joining us for our little chat about bodies and barrels. And we're going to go record some beer with the boys episodes for you guys. Cause you guys like those. Um, you. Any victims of crime episodes you want us to dive into. We've got a couple plans coming up too but if you have any topics or crimes you want us to cover specifically that are new versions of things that happen to bodies post them below we're happy to talk about them cover them and what we would do to take care of somebody in that scenario so check out brian and ryan over at undertaking the podcast and send out some love for john thanks guys see you soon